few months ago, I went to Ottawa for my brother's 40th birthday. And so my parents, they wanted to treat us all, so they took us out to a Chinese buffet house. And uh, I guess they figured, you know, 400 dishes, 4,000 calories, it seemed fitting on this great occasion. And the best part was I got to be there with a bunch of my nephews. So, so much fun uh, being there with them, but also a little disappointing. Right, this place had the deluxe lineup of everything you could hope for. Kung Pao chicken, all the classics, sweet and sour pork, dim sum, Peking duck, sushi, you name it. If you could imagine it, there it was in its most beautiful deep fried form. And I couldn't wait to dig in. But the boys, you know what they were most excited about? Jello. <laughs> Seriously, some of them went back for multiple servings of jello. <laughs> and by the end of lunch, you know, I was ready to explode, but we're heading out the door, and, uh, and these guys, they noticed the cotton candy machine, and so they begged their mom for some cotton candy, and she capitulated, so, of course, a little bit more sugar. I thought to myself, you know, instead of spring rolls, they went for a cotton candy. Instead of all-you-can-eat shrimp, they opted for all-you-can-eat jello. <laughs> They didn't see the big picture, right? They didn't understand that the whole point. So you go to these places to consume, set a record for the, the number of rich, delectable calories you can consume in one sitting. I mean, I mean, you're trying to put this restaurant out of business, right? Uh, but they're too young to possibly understand uh, the point of it all. Well, today, as I said at the beginning, is the Feast of Corpus Christi. The great solemnity of the most holy body and blood of Christ. And in a way, we celebrate this every single Sunday. We're celebrating this mystery of the body and blood of Christ every single time we come to it. In fact, every single day, if you want, Mass is happening. And, and yet, there's a moment on this feast to pause. To, to look at the big picture again. Like, what is it we're doing? Why are we doing this? How do we get the most out of it. And excuse the analogy, but I think sometimes we can approach the Mass the same way my nephews approach Chinese buffet, right? They're, they're willing to settle for jello. And, and similarly, we're not maximizing on the spiritual nourishment that is available to us in every Mass. If we don't understand the big picture, we won't prepare well. I know for myself that day, uh, I starved myself all day long so that I came hungry to that Chinese buffet house. I was ready to be filled up with, with lots of, I had this expectation, this, this desperation for food. Or my nephews, I mean, they're so young, they couldn't possibly appreciate the cost, right? How much it cost their generous grandparents to take us all out for all you can eat. And similarly, do we, do we pause to think about, you know, Who's paying for all of this anyways? And not just to have the lights on, but, but who's picking up the tab? Who's paid the cost for this meal? Who's paid the price? And, and I think for those of us who come to Mass regularly, and I don't know if this is a humble brag, but, but for over 20 years now, I've, I've been able to go to Mass pretty much every single day uh, as a seminarian, as a priest. And the consequence of that is I run the risk of, as, as many of us do, I think, of missing out on the big picture. This becomes so routine that we forget. What is it we're doing? Why are we here? We can take it for granted. And so today, I want to go back to the big picture, this why of the Mass. And, uh, and really, I'll give you a hint. This religious ritual that we're engaging in, it's rooted in relationship. And so... God the Father, we know this, God the Father created humans, you and me, for no other reason than love. It was so that we could be in relationship with him. You exist, you're here, you're breathing right now because God wills it. He wants you to be here. And yet, we have turned away from this relationship, from this friendship. I love the, the way Pope Francis put it. Uh, some years ago, he said, in a thousand ways, I have shunned your love. And isn't that true? It's true for me. 
in a thousand ways I've turned away from God. And yet God kept pursuing us. He kept seeking after us to the point that he sent his son, flesh and blood, to come to this earth to be among us, to teach us, to heal us, to equip us, and to feed us. One of the most important things that Jesus did while on earth was he invited his 12 to participate in what we know as the Last Supper, this sacred meal. And today we're in Mark's Gospel. Jesus offers himself as food to these apostles in these words. He, he offers them what looks like bread, and he says, this is my body. And he offers them what, what looks like wine, and he says, this is my blood of the covenants. And they ate, and they drank. Now, what's a covenant? You know, the blood of the covenant. What is, what is this all about? Well, in the Old Testament, there were all of these, I'll call them relational contracts that God established with the people. Uh, a contract, if you think, it's, it's an exchange of goods, right? Where I give you some money and you give me a block of cheese. <laughs> but a covenant is an exchange of persons. I give you myself, you give me yourself. Or this phrase, it's repeated often throughout the Old Testament. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. There's a sense he's saying, look, we're, we're exchanging our very selves. I'm going to be there to love you, to care for you, to protect you, to provide for you all of your needs. I will be with you always. That's what this means. This, this sharing, this relationship, this covenant. And, and I'm oversimplifying here, but... but Often, these many co covenants that were formed, Adam and Eve, God formed them with Noah, with, with uh, Abraham, with Moses, and many others. Often, there was a couple of things, at least two things that were quite common to these covenants. The first is that there was a sacrifice. So something is being offered, something precious. Often, it was a lamb or a goat or a heifer was being offered to God in sacrifice. And secondly, there was a meal that they would share this meal, and this meal would solidify the bond between these two parties. Okay, it's the sacrifice and this meal. And so, uh, fast forward to the New Testament. God wants to reestablish the covenant with the people. He sends his son, Jesus, and instead of saying, hey, I want you to go sacrifice an animal that you can find out in the field, he's saying, I am going to provide the most precious of all, my very son, to be sacrificed on the cross. And really closely connected to that is a meal, the Last Supper, where they share in this exchange. They re-enter the sacrifice. And, and every time we come to Mass, this is what we're doing. We're re-entering the sacrifice on Calvary, and we're sharing in this sacred meal. Now, maybe you've, ex you've heard that expression, you know, big high-flying business, business executives, they, get, they go out for a fancy dinner, and they say, you know, first the meal, then the deal. Have you heard that before? Yeah? Am I the, okay, a few of you have, yeah. It's like, you know, first we're going to lubricate things here a little bit, have a couple of drinks, your bellies will be full of delicious food, and then we're going to get down to business. Then comes out the agenda, right? Well, that's actually not what's happening here. In this instance, the meal is the deal, right? I, I guess the way I would say it is in the Eucharist, this sacred meal seals our covenant deal. By, by sharing in this meal, we're, we're sealing, we're renewing this relationship that we have with God. Just say this with me. In the Eucharist, this sacred meal seals our covenant deal deal. Let's say it once more like we mean it. In the Eucharist, this sacred meal seals our covenant deal. 
This is what's happening every time we come together in the Mass, that this covenant is being solidified. The bond is being renewed and deepened between God and us. So this is the big picture, that we're, we're sharing a covenant feast. And I don't want for you to be like my nephews, you know, the way they approach uh, Chinese buffet, just settle for the jello experience. I want you to get the most out of this. And, and that's why we're taking time to talk about this. You know, I feel like it's my responsibility uh, when it comes to Chinese buffet to really, as an uncle, to coach my nephews. And so I will be taking that responsibility very seriously in the coming months and years. Uh, but also, as a spiritual father to you, I, I want to offer a little bit of coaching, just a few pointers on how we can enter in and, and really receive in this covenant meal. So objectively, when we come to Mass, the highest point of the Mass is that moment of the, the great elevation. You'll see me later this Mass elevate the paten, that gold plate, and the chalice up, offering Jesus to the Father in the Holy Spirit. I think objectively that is the highest point of the Mass, and we all sing the great Amen. But subjectively, I would say, the highest point of the Mass is when we come forward to receive Jesus in Holy Communion. And I want us to, to be able to enter into this meal, this sacred meal, in the most beautiful way, in the most profound way, and not to be overly rigid or robotic, but also not to be casual about this, because it's so sacred. And so here's a few very, very simple pointers. I think this is going to be review for most people. But uh, as you approach, uh, first of all, just say amen. Amen. As, as the priest or the, the extraordinary minister of Holy Communion offers you the host, just say amen. Look them in the eye. Clearly, it, what that means is I believe. Secondly, you can receive on either the tongue or on the head. If you receive on the tongue, just open your mouth wide and stick your tongue out. You know, like really... Help us out here. I mean, sometimes people want to receive on the tongue. I know I'm not trying to be overly, but, but it's like, it's hard to get in there. And I don't always have the best aim. I don't want to, like, I don't want to miss, right? It's just too, too reverent a moment. So help us out. Uh, you can also receive on the head. And if you do, uh, just extend your hands out one on top of the other. Try to make your hands flat. Uh, sometimes I see people do kind of like the lobster pincers or, or different things, but just kind of receive like that and then consume uh, right away. Consume the host, uh, put it in your mouth, eat it before walking off, okay? This is, this is that moment where we're consuming, we're sharing in the sacred meal. Now, uh, some of this, like to receive on the hen, we didn't just come up with this. This actually goes back to the fourth century to one of those early church theologians named Cyril of Jerusalem. He said this, in approaching therefore, come not with your wrist extended or your fingers spread, but make your left hand a throne for your right, as for that which is to receive a king. So be thinking about that. I, this is a throne to receive Jesus, the king. And we often make this announcement, if you're not Catholic, and maybe there's people here today, you're not Catholic or not ready to receive, you can still come forward if you wish and just cro cross your arms over your chest and you will receive a blessing. Because what we're doing, we're, we're renewing, it's a sacrament of initiation. We're renewing this initiation. We're renewing this covenant where somebody has said, yes, I choose to be Catholic. And so we don't want to uh, presume something prematurely of people. No. I'm kind of uh, in teaching mode here, so bear with me. Uh, there's one other issue I'd like to address. Over the last little while, I've had people come up to me and say, say something to the effect of, oh, Father, when are we going to get the wine again? Father, when are we going to get the wine again? And it's like, well, first of all, stop whining, okay? <laughs> And secondly, Father, when are we going to get the wine again? The answer to that question is never. Because we've never distributed wine at this church or any Catholic church, and we never will. However, as of this Sunday, we will be distributing the precious blood. 
once again. So the chalice uh, containing the precious blood, and I don't want to be nitpicky, but I think our language really matters here because that is what we are partaking in, this blood of the covenant, this blood that renews our relationship with God. And uh, I want to just quote from the catechism uh, that's, uh, that is trying to express what's happening here. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity. So just think about that. God, his divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. So in a single fragment of the host, the whole Christ, his body, his blood, together with his soul and divinity, in a single drop of the precious blood, the whole Christ is present, his body, his blood, together with his soul and divinity. And so actually, as of today, you don't have to come forward to receive uh, communion under both kinds, both the host and the chalice. You're, you're free to do so. Um, but the reason, like you're, you're not going to get more of Jesus <laughs> if you do. But the reason we're doing this is because it helps us individually. It doesn't change the mystery objectively, but I think, again, subjectively, it can be a, a help to us to enter in and, and be reminded of what is this sacred meal that we're participating in. I'll give you an, an analogy with another sacrament. Uh, think of adult baptisms, right? We, we often have them at Easter around here. In order to celebrate a baptism validly, I could just take an, an eyedropper with holy water in it and say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, drop, and of the Son, drop, and of the Holy Spirit, drop. But what we do at the Easter Vigil is we get people drenched, right? Because it's way more fun, first of all, for me, but also because subjectively the people and, and us participating can experience it more fully. It does something. It, it, you'll never forget it, right? And so that's that it just helps us. Now, now, when somebody gets drenched, they're no more baptized than somebody else, but, but hopefully we can enter into this mystery. And so you're welcome to receive. Uh, you know, practically speaking, it's not going to be possible for every single person to receive from the chalice, but you're welcome to come forward and receive. And just as the minister says, uh, the blood of Christ, again, say amen, and then take the chalice with two hands and take a small sip and, and realize that you are participating in this blood of the covenant. Okay, so I've thrown like a whole bunch of instructions at you today, I realize, and, uh, and there's lots to remember, so please don't stress. It's not like if I forget something, but the bottom line, I do want you to remember the big picture, that in the Eucharist, this sacred meal seals our covenant deal. It brings us more deeply into this relationship where God is saying, I am giving you myself, literally. And in response, we can say to God, and I am giving you myself. And I want to go back to that quote from Pope Francis, and I want to give you the fuller quote. It comes from The Joy of the Gospel, uh, something that Pope Francis wrote a little over a decade ago. It's beautiful, and, uh, and I think it really can help us set the right disposition for approaching the Mass. And so uh, here's the quote, and I'll just highlight first that middle, that middle line as he's saying, yet here I am once more to renew my covenant with you. I mean, if that was on our minds and hearts every time we came to Mass, that would be enough. Here I am once more to renew my covenant with you. So if you want, I'm just going to read this prayerfully, slowly, and uh, you can just follow along in your heart and let this be uh, your prayer, your disposition here at Mass today. Lord, I have let myself be deceived. In a thousand ways, I have shunned your love. Yet here I am once more to renew my covenants with you. I need you. Save me once again, Lord. Take me once more into your redeeming embrace. 
Amen.